think I want to do it, but I remember speaking with Matt after our travels in Australia for a year, and I just remember saying, and I don't know, know if he said this as well, but I just remember saying, like, the next time I travel, I want to do it for a purpose and not in vain and do it for something. Like, we always talked about how how much we don't even know our own country, Canada, and how much we haven't seen. Hello, I'm Alan Hill. In this podcast series of The Nostalgic Vagabond, we're talking travel, all kinds of travel, with all kinds of interesting people from all around the world. In conversation, we'll share personal anecdotes, tales of adventure, and maybe misadventure too. Listen in for some unique cultural perspectives, tips from seasoned veterans, and an array of diverse experiences that have contributed to many life-changing journeys. Travel really is a privilege. We know that now. And if we can't do it right this very moment, let's talk about it then. Hey, where are you right now? On this episode of the Nostalgic Vagabond podcast, I talk with Matt Kholtnicek. Matt is another Canadian and fits my descriptor of Canadians being cool, charismatic, but kind of crazy. Matt and I worked together for a few months in Australia when he was travelling the world with Matt, another Matt, whom I also worked with. It was a little confusing at times working with two Matts, both Canadians and both kind of crazy. Matt Sebastian was the other Matt, in fact, who was on the previous podcast episode with Sean. It was this Matt, the Matt, my guest on today, who was one of the other riders who joined that epic East to West bike hike across Canada. In conversation, we talk about an accident that happened in Calgary that could have killed Matt, ironically on a bike. While he was in recovery with a busted jaw, broken arm, and a really sore head, he was invited on the journey, and after some deliberation, he decided to join, but make the bike trip his own at the same time. And why not try to raise money for charity too? So he did. Matt tells of some of the mishaps he endured, like when he got sick in Quebec, all alone, and had to make a deadline while cycling, soaked in the rain and dog-tired. The things you do for others, I suppose. Matt explains how this journey changed him, and some of the achievements he is proud of. Before we finished our kind of catch-up, I was curious to know Matt's favourite memories of the trip, and why he would recommend these kinds of epic adventures. It was great to have a chat with another old buddy after so many years. If there has been one benefit to this pandemic, it has been the willingness of people to reconnect over Zoom. It's been pretty sweet. Anyways. Let's get to the conversation. Good morning. Good morning. I guess it's not morning for you, but for me it is. Matt Chalupnicek, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. <laughs> Where are you based right now, mate? Uh, Lethbridge, Alberta, which is, uh, a lot of people don't know where it is. It's about two hours south of Calgary, Alberta. Yeah, I met a guy once from there. Uh, he was a very cool, fun-loving guy with lots of good stories. So I imagine you get some characters down on Lethbridge, eh? Oh yeah, it's been nicknamed. It's been nicknamed Methbridge, so <laughs> not for good reasons, but. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, we have a bit of a problem with drugs down here. Well, the guy I met was a a student. I think he was a a graduate student, so he 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 didn't definitely class himself as a method. I would have thought, though. I only met him for about a day, so who knows. <laughs> I don't think many meth heads are students down here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, Matt, I wanted to talk with you today on the podcast about a couple of things. First of all, a little bit of background on how we met in Australia years and years ago, and then going forward into the story and some of the interesting journeys and experiences you've had since then. I thought we could take our memories, if possible, back to 2009, because you and I worked in a supermarket together in Canberra, in the capital of Australia, for a few months. At that time, Matt, I hadn't actually met that many Canadians, but my kind of idea of them from stories I'd heard and, and TV shows I'd watched and, and just the general, let's say, stereotype, if you want, of Canadians, is that they were really cool people 
but kind of a little bit crazy. What do you say to that? I would say that's pretty accurate. Yeah, we can be pretty crazy, especially with the weather up here, how cold it gets. You have to just embrace life, no matter how cold it gets. So we learn to have fun. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I had that experience myself when I actually came to visit you. I think it was about a year later or so, maybe a little bit less. In April 2010, I was on a, a grand journey myself and met you in Calgary which is supposed to be spring, right? But I remember it's snowing pretty badly in April. It's pretty normal for us to not get real spring until about May sometimes. And I I remember growing up as a kid in Calgary, and it's actually snowed in August (laughs) a few times. It's like in in the midst of summer. That's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, when, when I came to see you, I was there for a few days. And one of my sort of fondest memories of those few days was you introduced me to this idea of a fixie bike, which I'd never come across before. Can you tell the listeners what exactly a fixie bike is? So basically there's no gears, just you got the chain and then you've got the front hub and then the back cog. So you can't change gears to go uphill. So it's extremely hard. (laughs) And then if you're skilled enough, you can actually pedal backwards and move backwards because the it's called a fixie because the back wheel is fixed to the pedals. So you can't coast. So if you're going down a big hill, mm. your legs are going as fast on the pedals as the back wheel. <laughs> and that's actually the reason <laughs> that's actually the reason I got in my accident. Part of the reason, because I was on a fixie mm. and they're pretty dangerous but they're fun do they have brakes you can you can get brakes so i think it's suggested (laughs) it's suggested (laughs) it's suggested to have brakes um on the front usually people put brakes because you can kind of brake with your back legs if you put enough pressure Mm. and then if you're skilled enough you can skid stop right so you just have to thrust your pelvis into the handlebars and then throw your strongest leg back and then that'll kind of put you to a skidding stop. But it's really hard to do if you're going fast. And <laughs> you don't usually stop gracefully. Either. Right, right. Yeah, I, I remember one evening when I was in Calgary, you had a shed, I think, at the back of your place. And there were a bunch of bikes in there. I was really impressed. He said, Alan, do you want to ride a fixie or do you want to ride a normal bike? And then when you told me what the fixie was, I was kind of terrified over the idea of it so i just went for a normal mountain bike we rode around calgary until the wee hours of the night and you were showing me some of the downtown neighborhoods and stuff and i remember also we probably were eating some pancakes and drinking coffee at like 4 a.m in a denny's i went back home around 6 a.m but you decided you wanted to drive to the mountains with a friend to go snowboarding for the day and to me that's just crazy but kind of cool so is that how you've always been just kind of free-spirited not afraid of not sleeping doing adventures and and crazy stuff I think I was a lot more like that when I had energy (laughs) and and now and now with two kids it's a lot harder I think I have to I have to be structured Mm. but yeah definitely in my younger years I was more eager to do that and I did that a lot when I was snowboarding like I would be up all night and then just go to the mountains. Yeah, I don't I don't think it'd be safe to do that now cuz I get so tired at the wheel <laughs> like just driving. <laughs> but yeah, I definitely was more like that and my brother my brother is a lot like that as well. So I think maybe it's a Canadian thing, I don't know, maybe it runs in the family. Mm. <laughs> it was definitely a level above my kind of standards and it, I mean, if I was to be crazy I wouldn't even be able to compete with that kind of stuff. So I was I was quite impressed. I'm like a mild version of what my friends were who got me into fixie bikes because mm. they were a whole other level. I, I remember following one of them around downtown and he would go up one ways in the wrong direction on his fixie bike. <laughs> yeah, it was like that was just wild to me, like dodging cars as he went. Yeah, I almost got killed by a bus. That was, yeah, <laughs> it was insane. I remember 
2010 April it was when I met you in Calgary, where you grew up. And I went traveling around uh, in more of Canada or in the States. I went to Europe for a bit. And I remember bumping into you again back in Vancouver, probably about 18 months later. And a lot in your life had happened during that time, uh, sort of back end of 2010 and the majority of 2011. Do you want to explain some of the major incidents that happened in your life in 2010 that led you to this crazy bike trip you made across Canada, which we'll get to later? So basically in 2010, moved out of my mom's place that you stayed at mm. in, around August. And then I had my own basement suite. I was really excited to live there on my own. And then my brother got kicked out of my mom's house. Um, and then he gave me a sob story about how he's going to be homeless. So I was like, you can just live with me then. So he lived with me and then we were there for about a month and we used to bike to work together. He he worked next to my, my job, so he's really close and we would just bike together. It was just a, a fun way to start the morning early at like 6 a.m. And then in September, it was September 28th, I woke up as per usual, made uh, my pile of pancakes, even though I was running late. But that was just my routine that whole week. So I was making all these pancakes and looking at the clock, which was really stupid because <laughs> pancakes take a lot of time. And then I left the pile of pancakes and then rushed out the door, didn't eat any of them. Mm. And that's all I remember because after that I woke up in the hospital. I guess what happened, I I don't remember this, but uh, I I distinctly remember stepping out of my door with my bike in my hands, forgetting the light on my bike and my helmet. And um, I was heading down towards work, down somewhat of a hill, on my fixie with no brakes. <laughs> and it was dark out. There was a pickup truck, a one-ton GMC Sierra pickup truck, coming towards me. And he turned left in front of me, basically cutting me off, not seeing me at all, because I was wearing... I was actually wearing all my clothes from Australia, like my favorite wool jacket that was black, so I was definitely not visible. Mm. And then I hit him, and judging from the damage on his truck, like from pictures I've seen, it looks like uh, like my my bike, the the handlebars damaged the door panel on his passenger side, and the mirror folded in, breaking the window. And then there was a perfect head-sized starring crack on his windshield on the top right passenger side of his windshield. So it looks like... I hit him right when he was turning at the corner mm. and my head hit the windshield and the rest of my body and bike went through the, the window. And I actually met up with him and he said the glass cut his face from the, the window breaking. Wow. Um, anyways, I woke up in the hospital and broke my uh, my jaw in two places, had a bunch of metal and pins put in there and blo broke my left forearm. Uh, like there's a common muted fracture, so all the bones were fragmented, so they had to put two plates and 13 pins in my left forearm. It could have been a lot worse, though. And then I had a massive hematoma in my head, like a big goose egg, basically, and no bleeding internally in my brain, luckily. But yeah, that changed my life. I had five months to really think about my life and recover. I was doing... Uh, a bunch of physio as well as just, you know, spiritual and mental rehabilitation because I, I didn't really like my job at the time that I was biking to. I was working for a friend and just driving truck for a, a paper recycling company. And like it was kind of a dead end job. So I had all this time to think about life and my uh, my church at the time was raising money for an orphanage in India in New Delhi. Mm -hmm. I contributed like to they had a silent auction. I did a couple paintings. Luckily, I didn't break my right arm because <laughs> that was my good arm. So I was able to still paint. Silver linings. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Um, so I contributed those paintings for this this orphanage, and then I just felt like 
I felt like this desire to do more for them. Mm. Um, but I mean, what could I do with my broken arm and jaw? I was actually for the first, I think it was for a month or two. I don't, I was in a daze for a good month, but I had to blend all my food on like my dinners. I had to blend in a blender and drink through the straw because of your jaw. Because of my jaw. Yeah. It wasn't wired shut, but it, it was wired. The mandible was wired at the back and the front. Um, and it was just so swollen. I couldn't even open it. But, uh, and, and I'm glad my brother lived with me because he did everything for me. It would have been hard by myself. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So basically I, yeah, I wanted to help this orphanage. So I was just thinking like, what can I do? And, and as if to answer a prayer, Matt Sebastian Mm -hmm. calls me up who you met in Australia at Coles as well. He calls me up New Year's Eve. Or was it New Year's Day? I'm not sure. It was like around the time of the new year. And him and his, his buddy Sean McCord had a had a great idea over a couple drinks that they would bike from Halifax where they were living to Vancouver, where Sean is from. And he knew that I was into cycling. Even though he knew I got hit by a truck while cycling, he still asked me, if I wanted to join them. And uh, I just remember like not being able to really open my mouth and just responding with, Oh, I'll have to think about it <laughs> because my jaw is kind of broken and my arm is kind of broken. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I thought about it a lot because this was only uh, like three months after the accident. I was like, yeah, I think I want to do it. But I remember speaking with Matt after our travels in Australia for a year. And I just remember saying, and I don't know know if he said this as well, but I just remember saying like the next time I travel, I want to do it for a purpose and not in vain and do it for something. Like we always talked about how, how much we don't even know our own country, Canada and how much we haven't seen. So I, I, I think that's another reason to go across Canada, but I, I really wanted it to be for something. So I called them back about a week later and I was like, you know, I've been giving it a lot of thought and prayer and I think it'd be really neat to do this for uh, this orphanage through my church and like raise money and, and raise awareness for it. Um, and he wasn't too keen, but then uh, I set up a website like, it was really easy on my MacBook, just click and drag and it looked really nice. I put profile pictures of him as well as myself and Sean. And then he was like super keen for it. Although we didn't, uh, we weren't able to do the whole country together. He started a month earlier. In the meantime, I was just rehabbing, going to physio because my arm still wasn't 100%. I couldn't even stretch my arm completely. Like I couldn't even extend it completely. And I was deciding to go on this big bike ride. So I was going to physio for that specifically cycling stuff. So I would do uh, like, I would probably, I probably went at least four times a week and my physiotherapist would make me cycle, but then also stretch my arm out and do exercises for my arm. And then I would also just mentally prepare myself and do big bike rides and then see how I would do on a, on a bike with my arm because I'd be biking sometimes 14 hours a day, I think was my biggest day. And you're putting pressure on your arm. So I was most worried about that. Do you think that having this ambition, the desire to raise money for the orphanage in New Delhi as a charitable gift? and pushing yourself physically and emotionally and spiritually to do this massive trans-Canadian bike ride. Did that help in your recovery, do you think, having that goal to get healthy and then do it? Oh, yeah, I think so. I, I Yeah, big time. If I didn't have uh, something to push towards, then it probably wouldn't motivate me as much to push through the pain and I mean, the the goal of biking across Canada in itself would be motivation. But uh, yeah, I think doing it for this, for the orphanage and raising money would, was, was a lot more motivating than, than just doing it. Mm. 
the idea of dedicating this bicycle ride to raise money for the orphanage? Was it based from your church's already set up affiliations or was it something that you kind of came up with on your own? Well, so they were already raising money and asking for money for the orphanage. And and then I just, I don't know, I've seen so many charity bike rides. Like I also did the MS bike mm-hmm. ride, the bike ride for MS. So I think it just came naturally, you know, doing a big event. And I don't know if you've heard of Terry Fox, but he was a, an amputee, one of he was a Canadian hero who who ran across Canada for for cancer. So it was just kind of ingrained already in my thinking. So I think it came pretty naturally to think. And, and it was mostly the phone call from Matt, mm. too, because he asked me to do it. I didn't even think about uh, the bike ride. I thought of raising money, but I didn't think how until he phoned me. And I was like, oh, yeah, that would be a great way to do it. So just kind of hit two birds with one stone. You yeah, know? I can kind of imagine you sitting in your your couch at home, can't move your jaw, can't really move your arm on the phone to Matt Sebastian and just this light bulb moment goes off. Oh, yeah, that's actually a pretty crazy, cool idea. Well, it took me longer than that because I thought it was insane. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I think that's where Matt and I, as friends, we've pushed each other a lot to do crazy things. Mm. I wasn't completely writing it off. I think that's why I said I'll think about it. And I thought about And almost after I put the phone down, I was just like, it was just kind of a rock in my shoe. And I thought that'd be really cool to bike across Canada. But it'd be really hard. (laughs) I don't know if I can do it. (laughs) If you were healthy, would it still give you the same kind of trepidation? Because it is a huge endeavor. But the fact that you were injured and in recovery... Did that make it seem even more of a huge challenge? I think so. Definitely because I knew that I'd have to recover first and I didn't know how long it would take. Mm. Luckily, meeting up with several doctors and physiotherapists, they said like that I could get 90, if not 100% of the strength in my left arm back. Mm -hmm. So they were all pretty positive, which I think helped me stay positive. And maybe also the trauma to the head made me think a little more crazy. So I don't know, that may have helped. (laughs) Any more crazy than previously. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Another concussion could could do you some good, you know. (laughs) Can you elaborate on some of the, the logistical details? Like, where did you start this ride? And what was your proposed navigation through the major cities as you headed west? Matt and Sean, they wanted to start at the beginning of May, and I I wasn't able to Mm because my physiotherapist said I'm close, but I need another month. So I started in June. I felt kind of bad for them because they had to basically waste a bit of time biking around. So they went to Newfoundland and biked around Newfoundland, which I didn't do. I went straight to Halifax. I put my bike in a bike box, right. and so it was disassembled, went to Halifax, and then from there I biked up to Quebec, and that's where I met with them. So I was by myself from Halifax to Quebec until I met with Matt and Sean, and then from there we biked together to Toronto, and then uh, stayed there for like two weeks because my sister was there, and and the logistics of of meeting at a bunch of different churches was probably the hardest part because church is on Sunday and that's when I would do these talks to raise money and awareness. Mm -hmm. So the church affiliation I was with, there's, uh, there were several across Canada. So I I had to phone them all and kind of organize this myself at the same time I was doing physio, planning out the bike ride, recovering, and then talking with pastors about whether I could go into their church and raise money and awareness. So that was a lot of legwork. Um, I could have used a secretary at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Would have been nice, but didn't have one. So after you were in Toronto for a couple of weeks, I guess taking a bit of respite, you know, with your legs, giving them a bit of a break, seeing the city a bit, catching up with your sister a little bit, and then carrying on west, I guess, did you hit all the main centers like... Uh, 
Winnipeg and then into Regina and yeah. and, and uh, Calgary? Or did you go up to Edmonton and, and then through that route? So from Toronto, Matt and I and Sean parted ways. So, mm. so Sean and Matt went ahead because Sean had to be in Vancouver for school at a specific time. And I still had to stay in Toronto because... I had to wait for this one church mm-hmm. and so it took a couple of weeks and and it kind of sucked because if if I biked for a long period of time and then I missed a Sunday then I'd have to wait for the next Sunday so you're you're there was a lot of rushing and then waiting when I was biking but they they went along the the lakes and then I went farther north so I missed all the beautiful lake biking and I went as far north as I could to Kapuskasing, even a lot of people from Ontario don't even know where it is. Or if they do, they're like, why would you go up there? <laughs> but there was a church up there that I went to. And man, it was it was just like miles and miles of trees. And they didn't really have mountains up there. It was like cliffs. Wow. And tons of like horrible black flies. So you're getting eaten alive <laughs> while cycling. So the goal was to cycle faster and faster. And then that took me west. And then I went down to Thunder Bay. And then I was able to see some of the lake there. But uh, yeah, I definitely missed the scenic route. And then from there, I, I biked across to Manitoba. Mm. And Manitoba, I think, was... It was probably the worst of the whole bike ride because everybody who I spoke with thought, why would you, why would you start from Eastern Canada and work your way West? Because you're going to get a headwind from the mountains. Mm. And I thought I would have a a really bad headwind in Saskatchewan as well as Alberta, but Manitoba was three days of just constant wind. And I didn't feel like I was moving at all I felt like like I was probably going 10 kilometers per hour because mm. I had I had about uh, 80 pounds of equipment on my bike alone in my panniers as well as food and and I learned to lighten the load after a while because I remember leaving Capuscasing in Ontario and just having cans and cans of food <laughs> And I, I filmed a big part of my journey, and I remember filming that part where I I had to leave all this food on the side of the road because <clears throat> it was just slowing me down. I had over 100 <laughs> pounds of weight, and I filmed it, and I was like, I, it was like a tragic event as if I was leaving behind a child because <laughs> I grew up to not waste any food. And, and I was in the middle of nowhere. Like, mm. I barely saw any trucks, so if anything happened, if I popped a tire or hurt myself I would have been I would have been in a lot of trouble so Mm. and then by the time I got to BC in the mountains I was pretty fit and and ready for the mountains and that was definitely the part I was looking forward to the most exciting part because it was the most scenic the hardest but I didn't care because it was it was awesome it was so much fun I guess contrary to what people were telling you about why would you go in a westerly direction because you've got a headwind well i suppose it gives you time to prepare for the mountain climbs of the rockies doesn't it you should be oh, yeah. at your fittest if you go east to west whereas if you go from west to east the rocky mountains are like at the beginning of the trip aren't they and it'll probably ruin you yeah and then on top of it like you in my opinion miss out on the best part of the country at the end of your trip mm. So for me, I was going, I mean, that's probably because I grew up near the mountains that I love them so much, but yeah, that was definitely the most scenic, most beautiful part. And I know in Ontario, they say they have mountains and they're beautiful, they're cliffs, but they're not, they don't give you the same sense of awe as, as going through British Columbia and Alberta. Yeah. You mentioned earlier, Matt, that in the months from the start of 2011 to when you actually left for this trip in the summertime, you were still continuing with your rehab. And so I imagine that was quite a challenging thing for you, sort of 
physiologically and practically to get your strength back and do your exercises, but also at the same time, quite emotionally challenging with a deadline approaching for you to be to a point of readiness for the the trip in starting in Halifax. Did you do any sort of financial preparation? Because obviously you must have had to have some kind of money to, I guess, pay for, for lodging, pay for food, pay for repairs to your bike when it inevitably got damaged. Um, so I've never been very good with money and neither has my family. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, they prepare, my dad was good in preparing us to be disciplined and work hard. The problem was I... I had to go on EI because of what happened. So I was getting money from the government and it wasn't very much. Mm. And I was able to work a little bit. So I did work um, a tiny bit uh, at a restaurant. But I basically just decided I'm going to give 100% of all the money I get at churches to the orphanage. And so whenever I went to a church, I would just... uh, I would tell them to either send the money to the church in Calgary or write a check to me and I would put it in an envelope and then mail it to the church. Mm. But uh, around, it was in um, New Brunswick. I can't remember the city, but I just remember I was like, I was doing bad financially, like really bad. And I was just like wondering where I'm going to get food, like the next meal. It was it was an oversight on my part. Um, I, I actually, I phoned my church and I asked them if they could put together an offering just to help with my logistical daily stuff. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, the church I was going to at the time, it was, uh, they, they decided that I kind of was pushing this bike ride on, on my own. And so the associate pastor told me you've wanted to do this bike ride mostly on your own so you can find your own way and ask friends and family. Mm. And I was devastated at the time because, well, I thought to myself, what is the church if not friends and family? Right. So if they're not going to help me financially, who will? And, um, and mind you, the, the organization I grew up in, the church that uh, my mom was going to, it was affiliated with the same one in Calgary. Mm-hmm. And that one helped me out quite a bit because I knew the pastor personally. I was good friends with him. And it was just funny because uh, they were part of the same umbrella. And, and yet the one church that I was going to wasn't helping me. But the other one that I didn't go to anymore helped me out significantly. So. I actually asked them if they could raise some money and they did it like without even batting an eye. The pastor was like, Oh, totally. We'll, we'll help you out. And then another pastor that I spoke with on the bike ride journey, he told me, well, why don't you just start taking at least 10% for yourself just for food and the occasional hotel and or motel or wherever you need to stay. Mm -hmm. So I started doing that. And initially I felt, well, I felt a bit guilty because like I was doing this for the this orphanage. and But I mean, if I couldn't even feed myself, then there'd be no point in doing it. <laughs> so yeah, I started taking money that way. And I honestly, for as far as lodgings go, I, I didn't really stay in hotels. I, for the most part, I had my single one man tent and I would just pitch it on like the side of the highway sometimes or I would just like find anywhere on the side of next to a river in a park. I remember when I was in Halifax, when I first flew to Halifax, nobody told me, and I probably should have researched this, the the airport is actually 80 kilometers north of Halifax. (laughs) And I arrived shortly after midnight and it's pitch black. And there's literally nothing around the airport, just trees, and it was cold and rainy. (laughs) So I was like, well, I'm going to bike in pitch black in the dark at night, 80 kilometers to Halifax. And 
I realized probably 40 kilometers in that this was a really dangerous idea because uh, I was on the highway, like a very busy highway with cars approaching from behind and I could have got hit. So I decided to just pull over into this small town called Fall River and I just pitched my tent in behind this, I think it was like a Baptist church or something. And then I woke up early in the morning because I, and I think that must have been like 4 a.m. Mm. that I pitched my tent there. And then I woke up like only three to four hours later because there was a school nearby and all these kids woke me up during their recess just screaming <laughs> and laughing. So I was like, okay, time to keep biking. So I just got up and kept biking the rest of the way to Halifax. But even in Halifax, like I I didn't stay in a hotel or hostel or anything. I um I pitched my tent in a park. Like it was a, a park right off the coast in Halifax and I had another rude awakening. I just heard a chainsaw and because I was among all these trees in this foliage and uh, I guess they were tree felling in <laughs> early in the morning and luckily none of the trees fell on me because I had a green almost camouflage tent and they were pretty close. So <laughs> I woke up and I'm like, oh, okay, I should probably leave because I might die Yeah, <laughs> like before the trip even starts. As far as um, any other lodgings, if I was speaking at a church in in a city I went to, then oftentimes like the pastor or somebody in the congregation would, would offer to have me stay at their house. So mm -hmm. that was really helpful. Like host you. Yeah. It seems like there are many instances, Matt, where you found yourself in kind of crazy situations. So I'm glad that you still live up to my initial... <laughs> interpretation of you being cool and crazy like waking up in the middle of a tree felling zone waking up behind a church in the middle of a school run yeah that's uh i can i can visualize all these images and it makes me laugh it's really nice <laughs> yeah it was it definitely wasn't without its trials so hmm. thinking back about the the mistakes i made logistically like even the bike i bought it was hmm. Um, it wasn't a fixie, was it? It wasn't a fix. No, I haven't ridden fixie since, <laughs> and I don't think oh, I right, ever since will. Since your accident, yeah, and maybe I would, but with a break. <laughs> <laughs> like it, the fixie I bought, it came. It was a fixie and a single speed, so you could. It came with brakes, and you could coast on it. But then, if you flipped the back tire you could turn it into a fixie. So my friends encouraged me to flip the back tire and take the brakes off because that was the cool thing to do. So, <laughs> the cool and crazy Canadian yeah, thing right. to do. <laughs> so I think if I ever do it again, I, I'll have brakes on it. <laughs> what would you say would have been your most challenging ordeals? And, and then how did you conquer them? The most challenging was probably getting sick on my bike ride. And um, that was in Quebec. And it was funny because I was trying to meet Matt and Sean. And I we planned for me to meet them at 8 p.m. at a library. And it was in, I, th I always mix up the city. It was either Trois-Rivières or Rivière-de-Loup. They both have the, the name River in them. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so I arrived in Quebec and I was coming from New Brunswick. It was bright and sunny and I was excited to be in Quebec because there was, it was called La Route Verte, the, the green route. The green route. Mm -hmm. And it was strictly for cyclists and it was just like, like miles and miles of cycling pathways. So in my mind, I pictured beautiful paved pathways and <laughs> At the time, that wasn't the case. No, it wasn't the case at all. So I, I literally get <laughs> over the border from New Brunswick into Quebec, and I was listening to this podcast um, about like challenges and being. It was it was a pastor talking about being pruned. He was talking about John fifteen and how like sometimes we need to be pruned just like a, a tree gets pruned to bear more fruit. So I was like, mm. I was like, God, can you prune me? <laughs> and immediately he answered that prayer because it started raining and it was miserable. And this path was just giant. It wasn't even small gravel. It was like 
probably half the size of my fist size of rocks. Like, wow. I think it was like, it was like a lime limestone. It was just, it was horrible to bike on. Like, especially with a road bike. So my tires were spinning. I wasn't moving fast at all. It was pouring rain. And then I got really hungry. So I just, there, there'd be these nice little picnic areas with, with some covering. So, so I'd get out of the rain and I, uh, I consolidated all of my broth that you, I don't know if you can buy it like this in England or Australia, but it comes in like, like cardboard cartons, kind of like our apple juice does here Mm. and like chicken broth beef broth so i i somehow had a a really big two liter plastic container that was from olive oil so i consolidated all my broth into that and it was a bad idea because (laughs) the broth went bad and i remember (laughs) pulling out this container because i had rice and this broth, and I was really hungry, I'm going to eat this, so I start taking the lid off of this container, and it built up all this gas that the lid actually shot off as I was unscrewing it. (laughs) And then I smelled it, and I was like, hmm, it smells kind of weird, but I think it's fine. I'll just cook it like a, a long, a long time. I'll cook it really well, and then it should be fine. So I made some rice soup with this broth, and I thought I cooked it well enough, but about 10 to 20 minutes later, like my stomach was rumbling and I thought like, I'm still really hungry. So I pulled over and all I had left for food was quinoa and a bit more uh, <laughs> beef broth and then some peanut butter. So I cooked that up and I mixed peanut butter with quinoa. It was the grossest, pastiest meal I've ever had. And I just threw it out after <laughs> <laughs> so I I was hungry. I went without food, and I I biked to this library in in Quebec, and I was just thinking the whole way like how I'm gonna introduce myself to Sean because I'm meeting him for the first time, and then meeting Matt after like months of not seeing him. So I was thinking of a really funny French phrase that I could say. So I don't even know. I think I said like I'm hungry. Um. How do you, I don't even know how to say that in French anymore. You've forgotten. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't speak French, so. I, uh, yeah, and they were in the library reading books, and they they didn't seem overly impressed, and I was, like, smiling. I'm like, let's go get some food. But then I think after having pizza, they, they were for, more forgiving because uh, I think they waited for quite some time. I got there at about 10, and it was, I think, 8 we were supposed to meet. So they waited a couple hours for me and we ate, I ate so much pizza that night and then we pitched our tents in some, some park and then we woke up and it was bright and sunny, but unfortunately this is a little bit graphic, but I woke up, um, and I had soiled myself. So seriously, uh, yeah, I soiled myself and (laughs) I I thought like, I I didn't think I was sick. I didn't think anything of it. And I just, I jokingly told Matt and Sean that I did that. And then I threw, I threw my underwear in a swamp and (laughs) got dressed and, uh, and then it was bright and sunny and the roads, it, it was as if they paved them that week because they were so smooth mm. and we were in the countryside. It was gorgeous. Um, but I felt really thirsty and dehydrated. So I picked up a bunch of Gatorade. Honestly, I, I could probably be sponsored by Gatorade because of how much I drank. And then we started biking. <laughs> and the funny part is, and Matt can probably tell you this, um, I guess he had been talking me up to Sean and saying like, oh yeah, he's this amazing cyclist, like he's done all these bike rides and and he got hit by a truck and he's still cycling. But they were ahead of me by like one kilometer and then it slowly became two kilometers and I could not keep up with them. Mm. And then I started feeling really sick and pulling over... I don't know. It felt like every 10 to 20 minutes I was pulling over and just, I didn't vomit at all. It was coming out the other end and I was just going in the ditch 
<laughs> and my <laughs> lowest point, which was probably the funniest point as well. And at this point, I couldn't even see Matt and Sean. Like, and it was pretty, pretty flat. And like you could see for miles, and I couldn't see them. Uh, they were probably like ten kilometers or more ahead of me. But uh, my lowest point was I didn't want to go on the side of the road anymore in case cars saw me, and um, <laughs> it was just kind of humiliating and <laughs> denigrating as a human being to to be shitting on the side of a highway. Squat. Yeah, right, right. So. <laughs> So I I saw this farmhouse and a beautiful white house. It, it was very picturesque and like just greenery around it. And I knocked on their door and, and I was hoping to use their bathroom, but it was getting very urgent and I'm like knocking even faster and harder and nobody answered. So I just, I went around to the side of their house and, and I did a wall squat, like a wall sit and, and I, and I just went all over their wall <laughs> <laughs> and they had beautiful white siding and then it and and it was like a it wasn't even a normal brown it was just like water and orange yeah and then i looked for a hose and they didn't like their tap had no hose on it so i couldn't even clean it off their house and i didn't have any paper i wanted to write a note saying i'm sorry so i just left it and then i kept biking and oh man I wonder how they came home. Like one day, maybe I'll find that house and and apologize and say that I was the guy who crapped on your <laughs> on your house. So by that stage, the food poisoning you'd given yourself had gone through your system so much that there was just nothing left inside you, but you were just still ill. I was, yeah. I had no choice but to keep biking. Oh, it man. was like, where am I gonna? I could sleep in a farmer's property, but then we didn't have. I didn't use my phone very much mm. um, just for emergencies. So I didn't really have a way of reaching Matt and Sean. So yeah, I just kept biking and then met them in Quebec city on top of it to add injury to insult. Like this is why I should have got a better bike. I bought a, uh, t it wasn't a touring bike. They had touring bikes for long journeys mm. and I had a cycle cross bike, which is for short, really fast races and apparently it was good for touring, but I guess not. Um, so in Quebec City, I broke the chain on my bike broke mm -hmm. and Quebec City is all hills. Yeah. So I'm walking everywhere on top of being sick. And uh, that was around the time that the Calgary Flames were in the playoffs. They almost this was the second time they almost made it to to getting the, um, the Stanley Cup. Mm -hmm. So. We arrive in Quebec. I, I caught up with Matt, or they waited for me. I didn't catch up at all. <laughs> they waited for me, and then we took the ferry across into Quebec City, and it was gorgeous. And then uh, shortly after, I broke the chain on my bike, and then I'm walking all over the place. I'm, like, exhausted pushing this bike with 100 pounds of weight on it. So I just told them, like, because we were planning to go to the pub and watch the game that night, and I was like, you guys go. I'm just going to find somewhere to sleep. So we found this wharf. There is a there was a bike shop on it, but it was unfortunately closed because I needed to get my bike fixed. So I just took my hammock and slung it up behind this bike shop on the, on the dock. I was just going to sleep and just recover. I, I wake up to the sound of tires on this wharf and... I'm kind of like opening one eye and seeing who's driving on this wharf. And then I realize it's a security guard. I'm like, oh, crap. So I close my eyes again <laughs> and I just pretend to be asleep so that maybe he'll leave me alone. And then he wakes me up and then he inquires about um, whether or not I defecated on the wharf. I'm like, no, like, <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I urinated off the wharf mm. and he's like, you can't be here. And I told him, I'm, I'm really sick. I'm waiting for this bike shop to open. And he showed me where the, the poo was. He's like, was this you? I'm like, <laughs> and the, the funny thing, I, I distinctly remember it not being me, but I questioned it because of how many times I actually did use the facilities on the side of the road. So I was like, well, and he didn't, he wasn't satisfied with my unsure answer. So he told me I needed to get off this wharf and Every bone in my body was just exhausted. My muscles felt tired. So I packed up and, and Matt and Sean left their stuff there too, 
so I packed up all my stuff and then I went to the a wharf like across from this one. It was probably a hundred meters away, but I had to like go back to the shore, walk across, and then go to that wharf where they had a restaurant. And then I bought a uh uh Monte Cristo sandwich. Like uh <laughs> okay. it, was, it was toasted with with some tomatoes and I took one bite and immediately felt sick. So I just left it. And then I saw Matt and Sean show up about, I don't know, an hour later and they're wondering where I am. They're looking around and I couldn't even like call out to them um, without exerting a ton of energy. I felt like Rose from the Titanic, you know, when she's <laughs> yeah, like, when she's on the door, she's like calling out, Oh yeah. Like on the door calling out for help. So I'm like, Matt, Matt, Sean, <laughs> like whisper yelling. And then finally they look over and they're like, oh, there he is. And they just jaunt over and they finish my sandwich for me. And then me and Matt, we were super cheap. So we just, we stayed, uh, I don't know if you've been to Quebec City. You know, I the have not been to Abraham. Quebec City, no. Oh, okay. It's beautiful. You have to go. One day. But uh, there's the Plains of Abraham. That's where like a, a bunch of battles ensued between the British and the Americans. And it's, it's more of like, um, a park now. So we were going to sleep there, but it was too public. So we slept in like a valley below it where there's just a bunch of trees and stuff. So me and Matt slept there in our tents and then, uh, Sean stayed in a hostel. Mm. And then by the next day, I felt a lot better. So you think the, the, the bug had passed through your system by then and Uh, the weakness was sort of going away and you could feel your strength coming back again yeah it was more or less a 24-hour sickness Mm. wow that sounds horrendous matt (laughs) it sucked but it was hilarious to look back on (laughs) just everything that happened but yeah whatever it seemed like during the course of this mammoth journey from eastern canada to western canada you were saying earlier that it was kind of stopping and starting with how you were trying to meet deadlines and then catch up to meet a deadline or you got sick and you fell behind and you had to speed up again. Do you remember how many days the whole journey took? Um, I don't remember exactly. Uh, I wrote it down. I started in June, beginning of June. So, and then September 21st was when I finished. So four months, the whole yeah. bike ride took me. Yeah. And that I found out that year that some guy, he got the record for, biking across Canada in the fastest time, which I'm sure has already been beaten, but he did it in 13 days. What? (laughs) And the guy was not young. He was in his 40s, and I guess he went all day and all night, but he had a team, so he didn't have all his luggage with him. Mm. He apparently ruined his knees doing it. I never looked into it too much. This is just what I heard from other cyclists as I was on my journey. Yeah, I... I can't imagine doing it that quick. You you can do it comfortably in a month or two. Mm. And I did it really comfortably in four months. <laughs> Was this guy who did the 13-day record a Canadian? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. <laughs> you'll, have to, I, you'll have to look it up. But yeah, crazy Canadian. I met a lot of people doing it, surprisingly. And there were a lot of um, older gentlemen in their, in their like 50s and even 70s. This one guy from Calgary was in his 70s and he said I've always had wanted to do this. I told my wife I had to I have to do this. I have to bike across Canada. Mm. And then I met this crazy French guy running from Quebec to Vancouver. He was running. And I remember seeing him from a distance and I think it was in Saskatchewan and I was like is that a woman running topless because <laughs> all I could see was this really long blonde hair and he was running in the same direction as me, and then just a really tanned body. And I got closer. I'm like, no, that's a dude. And <laughs> he's running with with one of those um, those runners for children that you put your kid in, and that was where all his stuff was. So I was just having a conversation with him, and he was running and, like, talking with me just comfortably, like, wow. not even winded. Yeah, I was impressed by that. Like, biking is is hard, but I can't imagine running it. Like, I'm not really big into running. Yeah, it's intense, man. I was wondering, Matt, can you articulate in what ways this mammoth bike hike across Canada changed you? Were there any specific moments that changed you, or is there a story that you can share 
of how this experience pushed your life into a new trajectory? It definitely made me appreciate life. I think that was mostly from the accident. Mm. Just uh, the, I think the accident leading up to all of this changed a lot. And the bike ride was kind of auxiliary to that. It was kind of part of that. I don't see it as a separate event entirely mm. because the next two years drastically changed. And I, and even if, even if Matt phoned me and asked me to do the bike ride, if I had not been hit by that, that vehicle, I don't think I would have done it because of my job. Mm. I, I was kind of stuck there and committed to just working and doing the daily grind. So I think the, the accident as well as, the bike ride and uh i didn't tell you this part but the accident motivated me to become a, a paramedic and i actually did the emr program also in the midst of of training for the bike ride and that was like a three month basically twice a week program this is basically paramedic school it's like uh e emr is like advanced first aid mm. so i took that january to march and that was another reason I couldn't leave early for the bike ride. I had to finish that and do physio. So, yeah. And it's funny, even even meeting my wife was uh, because of getting hit by a truck and because of the bike ride. It was kind of a combination of the two because I met her at this cafe where, when I was talking about my bike ride across Canada. I... I wanted to work for her dad who was uh who owned a company that did patient transfer so mm -hmm. yeah it was and i met her through her dad actually i didn't sorry i didn't meet her at the cafe i met her friend at the cafe who told me about her dad mm. who had this company that helped out paramedics so it seems like all of these events are kind of linked together oh it yeah it starts with a bike it finishes with a bike and there's a lot of drama and intensity a crazy odyssey in the mix Oh yeah, like if if I had not been hit by that truck, I would have never wanted to go on the bike ride, I don't think, cuz I would have how would I take 4 months off work? It'd mm. Be impossible. I would have never wanted to become a paramedic because I wouldn't have all this time to think about my life and what I'd want to do with it. Mm -hmm. And then because of that, I would have never met my father-in-law who I worked for and would have never met my my wife. Yeah. So yeah, and I, I actually, it was funny, everyone jokes like, oh, you started dating the boss's daughter, and I was like, yeah, no, yeah, pretty it's much. the first time I've heard that, mate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, was a, it was a double whammy. Yeah, your your friend Tom said that in... Yeah, Tommy in, Quinn, uh, yeah, of, on the fishing right, boat. Yeah, yeah that's, that's true. That's funny. That's true. <laughs> Matt, is there something that you're most proud of in terms of this whole journey you've been on with your biking? Uh, is there something, maybe uh, a personal weakness that you were able to recognize and overcome, or maybe just the whole idea that you finished this adventure, something that you're proud of? Oh, yeah, that's, uh, I think there's a lot of things. I think, um, I think the biggest thing was um, how much money was raised for this orphanage. Mm -hmm. And uh, mind you, I've I've heard of a lot more money being raised over a shorter period of time, but I felt pretty proud because at the end of it all, it was ten thousand around ten thousand dollars raised. The thing is, like, I don't even know if that accounts for all the people I just handed pamphlets to and told them to donate because I would do that too as I was biking. Uh, so it could have been more. Mm. I'm not sure. So that, as well as the fact that I, I had a odometer on my bike mm -hmm. and I actually like from coast to coast if you're taking the number one highway then you would put 6,000 kilometers on your vehicle or bike or whatever you're, you're riding and I actually managed to put 9,000 because <laughs> because of Ontario yeah. because I went far north and far south and then even Saskatchewan because I was trying to meet all these deadlines I remember biking to Swift Current which is far west, and then biking back to Moose Jaw and then mm -hmm. back to Swift Current because I was like, well, this 
my Swift Current had like a Wednesday night youth group that I spoke at. And then I went back for the Sunday mm -hmm. at uh, Moose Jaw. So there was a lot of back and forth. I uh, I felt like I was cheating because I was maybe like 60 kilometers outside of Calgary and some guy is pouring rain as I was drenched and some guy pulled up in his pickup and he's like, hey, you want to ride? And I'm like, yeah, sure. I just won't <laughs> tell anyone I got to ride into Calgary. But now I don't care because I put 9,000 kilometers on my bike. I'm pretty sure I could pretty sure I deserve that free yeah. ride into Calgary. I think you well and truly covered the distance in terms of miles. Yeah. In terms of just the pure numbers, the fact that you bunny hopped a ride, I think you can get away with that, mate. <laughs> I think I got away with it, yeah. Do you have a, a favorite memory of the whole trip? I mean, you have a favorite bad memory, which is shit in your pants, but do you have a favorite good memory? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can only really think of another funny story, but it was also kind of a bad one. But it's hard to think of like a good favorite memory, but... I think maybe hmm maybe in Ontario when I I think I got um the most kilometers in one day on my bike it was uh I got 244 kilometers in one day in one day I think I biked for like 14 hours or something and it was funny cuz this woman she gave me some kind of energy drink but it came in like a powdered form and she's like oh this is uh, what was it called like isogenics i think or something right but uh she said uh this this will give you energy and and it did like wow i actually felt like i could have kept biking i biked uh, was it sudbury to timmins or Barry to timmins anyways i i needed to just stop in timmins but i felt like i could keep going and I didn't need to keep going. I was like, I'm not even hungry. This is amazing. <laughs> like, how have I biked this far and sustained this much energy? I think I need to force myself to eat. So I forced myself to eat. So that was a, like a big accomplishment day for me. And I felt elated that I was mm. full of energy, able to bike that much. Meeting up with Matt and Sean, mm. like we had really good memories. Um, I did most of the country by myself, which was... It was good and bad, but like Matt and I traveled all of Australia together. So it was like we never stopped traveling. Yeah. So it was really nice to meet up with them. I remember like Sean was just this goofy dude. Like we would just be biking and singing Creed at the top of our lungs. <laughs> like, can you take me yeah, yeah. higher? Like just <laughs> yelling it. And yeah, I felt like Sean and I connected really quickly and uh yeah it was it was a lot of fun uh biking with them and and sean is like another level of crazy too he can tell you this but he he actually got hit by a car in quebec when me and matt were hanging out i don't know why we were separated maybe they'll remember but yeah like he <laughs> <laughs> and and the way he describes it's hilarious too yeah. But I oh yeah, and I also got hit by a bus in Ottawa. Um but that was mild. It was very mild. Uh and the reason why is because of my bike problems. Like Matt and and Sean had they they popped a few tires, but I I recorded it somewhere and I actually I have over 20 pop tires, about 20 spokes broke. I replaced the back rim three times and the back tire four times just so like i i got used to carrying a, a spoke key and spokes with me because i would break spokes all the time wow and when i was uh when we were leaving ottawa i broke one or two spokes and we're like literally outside of ottawa and then matt was just like oh no and i'm like no so i just told him i'm like just go on without me and take your time or I don't care. I'll catch up. I have to go back to Ottawa and mm. like go back to that bike shop. We were literally just at and <laughs> get this bike fixed. So backwards and forwards again. Oh, I know. It was just a lot of back and forth. So I go back and then I remember it was a pretty cloudy day, but it was clear. Like it wasn't raining. And then I make eye contact with this bus driver. He's in a school bus and he's trying to turn left in front of me. 
and I'm biking towards him, and I, I swear we made eye contact. But he just starts going anyways right when I'm there. And so I'm going into the middle of the road. I'm like, shit, 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 shit. And then I'm on the <laughs> other side of the road, and I'm I'm like, he's going to hit the back of my bike. Yeah. Um, and he hits the back of my bike where all my clothes are, luckily. And he just sends the bike flying, and then I land on the road on my feet. I'm like, what? How did this happen? <laughs> And then he, he notices that he hit someone, so he pulls over on the side of the road after he makes the left turn. And then he gets out, and he's a French guy, um, so immediately I thought he was angry at me. And he's like, <laughs> hey, you! In his French accent, I'm like, oh, what? Like, why are you getting mad at me? But he was actually just concerned, and he calls me over, and he's like, are you okay? Like, I thought I killed you. Yeah. And, uh, no, no, like, but is my bike okay? And... I get him to hold my bike up and I, I pedal it to see if he wrecked it any more than it was. And all these kids in the school bus are like looking out just like, oh, just amazed that this guy hit some, some cyclist. And luckily my bike wasn't wrecked anymore. And I just went back to the, the bike shop and managed to catch up with Sean and, and Matt, actually. So much drama. So man. that was a funny memory. Oh, yeah, it was fun. My favorite four. So I've got four questions for you. What is your favorite book? Lord of the Rings. What is your favorite season? Summer. What is your favorite city? Oh, hmm. that's a tough one. Calgary. <laughs> and finally, Matt, what is your favorite mode of transportation? Ah, uh, yes. Well, I don't bike much anymore. <laughs> I do like it, though. <laughs> Oh, man, I'm turning into an old man. I'll have to say driving. I do like driving. So you're a car man now. Well, I mean, I don't have an impressive car, but... <laughs> you enjoy it. <laughs> Better than biking. <laughs> I enjoy it. I, I like biking. I, I got to do more of it. But, uh, yeah, the city I'm in is not not. It's not that bike friendly. My favorite four. I was wondering if you would recommend this kind of crazy long-term biking adventures and if so why i would definitely recommend it it's like you'll grow so much you'll figure out who you are you'll challenge yourself <laughs> it's funny though i don't know how matt does it because right after this journey he asked me if i wanted to bike down from uh banff to new mexico and he did the continental divide and i'm like nope <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not doing a big journey like that. Not for a long time. I was keen on resting after that. But I, I would have, I definitely would do a smaller bike ride, like maybe in, I don't know, in Europe or something. I would definitely recommend it. Like you get your exercise, you see more, you experience more. Where, whereas like as much as I like driving a car, like you miss a lot, a lot of nature, a lot of the simple small quiet things around you yeah i would definitely recommend it at least once in your life every canadian should bike across canada <laughs> <laughs> great man well thanks for your time matt chalupi thanks for coming on the podcast yeah thanks for having me that was really fun thanks for listening to the nostalgic vagabond i hope you enjoyed listening to our conversation and if you would like to listen to other interesting talks on travel there are more podcasts available check them out wherever you get your podcasts and for updates, just follow me at The Nostalgic V. Don't forget, your journey is special. Own it. I've been Alan Hill. Until next time. Hey guys, if you enjoy listening to The Nostalgic Vagabond, why not support the podcast? If you haven't already, subscribe and you'll be notified when new apps drop. You can also support the podcast by leaving a rating or a review on your podcast app. Why not share this episode? Tell your friends about it if something resonated with you. Word of mouth is great promotion.
If you're into social media, maybe post a screenshot of the episode or upload the link on your profile so your mates can see what interesting content you've been into lately. All your support comes straight back and helps to keep the travel content and nostalgia of this podcast going. Cheers. So don't forget to subscribe.